All right. So we move on here. <coughs> Having calculated the transmission line parameters, now uh, <coughs> we have to represent this transmission line. And uh, again, uh, assuming that it's a, a perfectly balanced system, we can only uh, we only need to look at uh, uh, on a per phase basis, and that is what we are doing. And in fact. Uh, it only makes sense to uh, analyze this the way we are doing it under sinusoidal steady state conditions. But using this Laplace operator S makes it easier, so that's what I have used here, but it's really equal to J omega, okay? And so when I talk about V sub S or I sub S here, it's really e equivalent to under sinusoidal steady state conditions, uh, a phasor with a bar on top, which is uh, with a magnitude and a phase angle here. So whatever you see in Laplace domain here uh, corresponds to uh, uh, the, the same circuit in phasor domain, where you plug S equal to J omega. <coughs> All right, so what we see here is this uh, uh, transmission line representation. Let's think of uh, v uh, receiving end as uh, our uh, origin for space, and this distance x is increasing in the way shown over here, like this. And uh, so we are trying to, and this is our sending end over here. So that's the symbol S over here. And for the receiving end, the symbol R. And uh, uh, so at any given distance X, uh, we have a current I sub X, and we have voltage V sub X over here, okay? So the so next step we have is to then uh, write uh, partial differential equations and solve them. And we are not going to write those partial differential equations. They are no more than a page long, and uh, you know we can easily see how they can be solved. But let me just uh, <coughs> highlight the, the results here, that we have this parameter gamma, uh, which consists of alpha plus j, j beta. <coughs> and then we have the, the characteristic impedance, z sub c, which uh, uh, consists of uh, the line parameters here. So in writing this, we are not ignoring any, anything. We are including uh, even the shunt conductance uh, associated with this transmission line. So using the receiving end voltage Vr of S and the receiving end current Ir of S, we can write the voltage at any point along this transmission line and similarly, we can write the current at any point along this transmission line, okay? So this V sub X and I sub X, we can write in terms of VR and IR as I have done in this, these two equations using gamma as defined here and surge impedance as defined over here, okay? So the, no approximations here. Okay, now, to, to make sense out of that and find out how much we can load these transmission lines, let's make some approximations, okay? One is that we'll assume a lossless line, okay? Just for, you know, get some, to get some handle on this here. So to do, uh, by assuming a lossless line, what we are saying is that there's no resistance and there's no shunt conductance G. So this is the lossless line as we see here. And, and in that case, this gamma that we had seen earlier uh, becomes equal to J beta, where beta is just omega times square root of LC, and omega, of course, is the line frequency 2 pi F. F is 60 or 50, depending upon uh, where you are. <coughs> and uh, the characteristic impedance uh, becomes a real number, as shown here, square root of LC, L over C, right? So that's, uh, that's a real number, and uh, we will load this uh, transmission line with this characteristic impedance, which is a resistance here, okay? So a line such loaded is called a surge impedance loaded line, and SIL is short for surge impedance loading because that's what we are connecting as the load here. And in this line, <coughs> The reactive power consumed per unit length is 
the reactive power supplied by the transmission line. Okay, so that's an important thing to note here, that you'll find that in this case, uh, whatever is uh, reactive power that this line consumes, it's supplying by its uh, shunt capacitance over here. And uh, the surge impedance loading then can be shown, uh, this is a three-phase value here, uh, so that's line-to-line uh, -line voltage squared divided by Z sub C, which is given by this expression here, okay? <clears throat> so if you look at the voltage profile of uh, surge impedance loaded line here uh, by this Z sub C, which is a resistor, uh, you will find that the, if you hold the sending end voltage at one per unit and receiving end voltage at one per unit, the voltage profile along this line would be flat. It will remain at one per unit here, okay? So that's, a, you know, a very good thing to know, that uh, surge impedance loading would have that effect. If you load this line beyond the surge impedance, that means heavily loaded line, and again, you just hold the, the terminals of this line at one per unit, the voltage profile would look like this. It will be minimum at the, in the middle. Whereas if you are, you know, lightly loading this line below the surge impedance loading, then the voltage profile would be like this here, okay? And, uh, <clears throat> and the other thing I could point out here by changing the color here is that uh, uh, when you have surge impedance loading, you really don't have to supply any reactive power from the terminals. But when you have a line which is heavily loaded, then uh, you have to supply reactive power from both sides over here, like this. Whereas when you have lightly loaded line, uh, then this, the reactive power will be supplied by the line to the terminals over here. Okay. So that's uh, something added that we can keep in mind. <clears throat> All right. So again, some typical values are shown here. Uh, this is, a, like I mentioned to you, is a three-phase number, and you can see that if you have 230 kV line, uh, the surge impedance uh, loading value is uh, 140, whereas if you go to 500, uh, you get go to uh, 1,000 megawatts. Okay. So if you have to transfer 1,000 megawatts, uh, you know, you'll wonder, should I build this line at 500 kV, or should I build it at 230 kV? Well, uh, you know, the, uh, it sort of gives a feel for what uh, you have to do because uh, uh, at 500 kV line, you can transfer a lot more power than you can at uh, 230 kV. Okay, so the higher the power transfer capability that you need, higher would be the transmission line voltages. Okay, so they go hand in hand. <clears throat> so th then the question becomes uh, uh, how, sh how should these transmission lines be loaded? So if you have a short length line, let's say less than 80 kilometers, just uh, these are uh, ballpark numbers, then the limiting factor is really the heating of those lines. And you would like to be, you know, probably somewhere above three times the surge impedance loading. Whereas if you have a medium length line, somewhere in between 80 to 240 kilometers, then I think the voltage drop becomes a consideration and uh, if you want to keep the voltage drop to be less than 5%, then the number would be uh, about, uh, you know, between 1.5 and 3 times the surge impedance loading. And uh, <clears throat> if you have a long line, then the stability becomes a consideration where the two terminals of this line should not be too far apart in terms of phase angle because uh, higher the, the phase angle between the two terminals, uh, more severe would be the stability problem under transient conditions, okay? So stability becomes a consideration, and we'll talk about stability in one of the chapters, or in modules, I should say, and then the amount of loading is somewhere between one and one and a half, okay? So it gives you some idea as to where, uh, where how much we can load these uh, transmission lines here. <clears throat> All right. So... Uh, now we move on and say that, look, if we really don't care in our an analysis what is happening in between the terminals, and we are only looking at from the terminals, 
under steady state operating conditions, then why do we have to model this line by distributed parameters? It's really not necessary. And uh, uh, recognizing that line itself is distributed parameter line and the voltages are whatever they may be uh, in between the terminals, okay? But if you don't care for our analysis uh, purposes, then it's okay to use this lumped model. And, you know, if you not make any approximation, then we can say, okay, uh, it's really a, we are treating it as a long line and looking at from the terminals uh, and repeating some of the things, this gamma is alpha plus J beta. I have not ignored anything here. As you can see, uh, R and G are included. The characteristic impedance, again, we saw earlier, is given like this. But <clears throat> using these here, we can uh, show this pi uh, network representing uh, the transmission line looking from the two terminals over here. Okay, and this Z series uh, is given by this expression, uh, this here, and the, at both hands we have this Y shunt over two, which is given by this expression here. And again, uh, this is in Laplace domain, but uh, under sinusoidal steady state condition, S is equal to J omega, and th therefore V sub S, uh, you know, in Laplace domain is really this phasor, and uh, which can be represented like this here. So this is uh, the lumped model, uh, which, uh, uh, you know, doesn't have any approximation as such, okay? So this is uh, sort of a long line model here. But uh, <clears throat> if the line is less than 200 miles long, I think uh, just to get a feel for what that model is telling us, okay, we can make uh, some approximations, and uh, what we see here is a model which is very, it can, we can put sort of our hands around it, because what it has, uh, again, looking from the terminals, the line resistance of the entire line, the line inductance of the entire line, uh, so these two in series show up like this here, as shown, and if you take the capacitance of the entire line, omega C of the entire line, and split it like this over here in terms of these capacitances here. So this becomes the model, uh, lumped model for a medium length line. So what we took, the actual line, and said, okay, if it's not long, too long, we can make certain approximations, and here is a much simpler model as compared to what we saw earlier. But once, if you have computer programs, who cares? But uh, just to get a feel for it, it's much nicer to see this model as compared to the other model. <clears throat> and if you really have a short length line, then you can even ignore these capacitances in this medium length line, and the model that we get is right here. And quite often, we, you know, just for stability analysis purposes and so forth, you may want to even ignore this resistance over here. So all we have is this inductance representing the transmission line. So it really depends upon what type of study that you're trying to conduct, right? So that's what it basically boils down to. <clears throat> so I think uh, we have uh, pretty much uh, covered what we need to cover uh, for as far as transmission line goes. So the next uh, thing we'll look at just in one slide is uh, uh, underground cables. So first of all, I think less than 1% of the transmission network consists of these cables. And these cables are used uh, close to metro areas where, you know, the, where land is uh, of premium value. So you want to bury these uh, uh, transmission lines uh, underground. And uh, so we get these cables here. And uh, <coughs> uh, these cables, uh, Conventional wisdom is that they are five to 10 times more expensive than transmission lines, although some people would challenge that. And uh, so with good trenching technology and so forth, uh, hopefully that cost uh, of these cables comes down. Uh, <clears throat> and one of the characteristics of these cables is that their capacitance is uh, much, much higher than transmission lines, as you will expect they are in very close proximity and uh, in ground. And uh, therefore, their Z sub C value 
is much lower. For example, one of the homework problems uh, we have in the back of this ch uh, chapter, this Z sub C is only uh, 25 ohms as compared to 300 ohms for overhead transmission lines. So that would imply that you could, the surge impedance loading would be very high, okay? Because remember that in surge impedance loading, Z sub C was in the denominator. So this uh, surge impedance loading could be very high, but you cannot really load these cables to, uh, to that level because you have to remove the heat, the loss that occurs in this transmission line when it's buried underground is very difficult. Okay, so a lot of those considerations come in, and uh, so I think cables is uh, really a study in itself, and uh, we are not going to go into it in this uh, module here, in this first course. Okay, so that uh, pretty much brings us to the co completion of this module that we looked at uh, the need for transmission lines, uh, we looked at uh, the, their geometry, and we looked at their parameters, uh, how we can calculate them, uh, how we can represent a distributed parameter line, and uh, what is the meaning of surge impedance loading, and how can we, how much can we load these lines, and then if we are uh, concerned about modeling them only from the terminals, then it makes sense to model them as lumped uh, models like this here, and how we can do that, and uh, you know, in one slide we also looked at cables. So that pretty much completes this module, and uh, thank you very much.